Good morning, church. How you doing today? Yeah, everybody good? Good. You're the, you're the second service crowd. You're the lively crowd. I can tell already, right? Okay, good, good, good. All right. So uh, today we're in, oh, let me introduce myself first. My name's TJ. What's yours? I'm just kidding. You just laugh at me. That's cool. I'm the pastor of the short church. Uh, if it's your first time with us, I'll be in the lobby after service. I'd love to shake your hand. And uh, we're kicking off a brand new series called Galatians. And in the book of Galatians, uh, we're going to learn uh, kind of a couple verses at a time over the next couple weeks. And, and those verses, we're going to kind of expound on. So we're not going to blow up a whole chapter. We're just going to take a couple verses from a chapter here and a chapter there, and we're really going to expound and expand on it, okay? Uh, so that's what our goal is throughout this series. And this series is designed for us to get a little more rooted in, in the things of God's Word. We're in a summer, uh, kind of fa- uh, like we're first, first Sunday in June, which is like the beginning of summer, and so we're kind of in our summer mode as a church. And I like to take summers and really start to kind of grow our faith grow our depth in God's word, and really kind of dig in a little deeper. So that's what my goal is today, all right? So let me pray for you guys, and then we'll we'll, uh, go on with service. Father, thank you so much for what you're doing in this place. I pray that you would open our hearts to receive what you have for us, that your words would be uh, come alive from your book, and, and that you, God, would penetrate our hearts, and that we may know your love. In your name we pray. Everybody says, amen. Now, the book of Galatians is written by a guy named Paul. Paul used to persecute Christians, but then became one himself after a crazy encounter with Jesus. And and so after this encounter with Jesus, he goes on a journey around the Mediterranean and starts to to tell the world about Jesus, and he starts new churches along the way. And one of the churches that he starts is the church of Galatia. And the Galatia is a region um, in, in the like Asia Minor, sort of that eastern Aegean Sea kind of area. And, and it's a, a larger area with multiple cities. And so he's writing to this area where there's a, gr- a large group of people. Now, he, he typically opens up his letters uh, with a greeting, and that's what he does in the book of Galatians. He, he says, my name's Paul, uh, chosen by Jesus to bring God's word to the Gentiles, grace and peace to you. And then he usually tells the, the, this group of people that he's writing to uh, that what, something that they're doing good. So uh, whether it's the Philippians or the Corinthians or the Thessalonians, whatever, he, he writes something you're doing good. But in, in this book, Galatians, he kind of skips the part that you're doing good and he starts to say, well, you're not doing good. <laughs> he kind of, he skips the nice part. You ever hear the, the, the advice that if you're giving a correction, it's supposed to be positive, give them something that they need to work on, and then end with something positive, like the positive sandwich, right? Paul's never heard of that. He's not, he's not one of those people, all right? So, so when we dive in, he said, I'm Paul, I'm writing to you. And then he says this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ. He goes, it is amazing how fast you're screwing this up. Like, that's what he says. He goes, hi, my name's Paul. Uh, I helped start this church. You guys are astoundingly stupid right now. That's what he's saying. He's going, it's amazing how terribly quick you've abandoned the Jesus who saved you and are turning to a different gospel, a second gospel gospel, which is not really a gospel. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. He's writing to this church in Galatia because he taught them about Jesus. He taught them about his love, his redemption, the cross, all of it. Then after he has gone, some other people came in and taught these people some new things, some things that they really need to do to become real Christians. There's some extra rules that you need to follow. They were called the Judaizers. They were coming from uh, Jerusalem, and and they believed in Jesus, but they also believed that people needed to follow the Jewish law as well as accept Jesus. And in doing that, you would be a real Christian. And so Paul is greatly disturbed by this because the people of Galatia are believing that they need to do the external things in order to earn salvation from God. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, Jewish law, there's a lot of changes that these Gentile people, these non-Jewish people would have had to make. 
They had to make changes to the way their work week looks, their, their, uh, the way they dress, what they eat, how they eat it, how they prepare, how they eat it. They would have had to change. All the guys would have had to do something that would not be pleasant. You know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just talk to your neighbor. They'll probably inform you later. You know, there's, there's, there's all these rules, all these rules. And, and, and Paul's going, what are you doing? What? Jesus never came for the rules. He came for you. And there's no thing that you can do that will actually get you ready to receive that love. You can't work your way into this, right? So, so the question we're going to ask today, based on this passage, is, is this. Here's the key question. How am I going to become godly? Paul says, I taught you this gospel, but you're believing this other gospel, which is really no gospel at all. But it's, a, but it's a set of rules that's going to try to make you look like you are godly. So the question for us today is, like the Galatians, are how are we going to look godly? The Galatians were asked this question by Paul, and we are asked this question, but it's really a question that is as old as humanity. It's a question that's been around since the very first people. In the book of Genesis, we read about a man and a woman, Adam and Eve. And in Genesis chapter 2, we read this. Now the Lord God planted in a, gar a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all the trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden, there were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two trees right in the middle. And Adam is faced with a choice between these two trees. This is the choice. One gospel versus the other, not really gospel, gospel, right? And that goes on, continues in chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you'll surely die. There's, there's two trees. You can eat from one and not the other. They're right in the middle. And right in the middle is the choice between the tree of life, the true gospel, or the knowledge of good and evil. You try to do what's right and not do what's wrong, and if you do right and not wrong, then you will be godly. And Adam has this choice, and Eve has this choice. Well, in chapter 3, the very next chapter, we read this. Uh, go, yeah, chapter 3, go back one, please. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tr any tree in the garden? You see how he frames the question? It's like kind of half true, but not true. It's like she, she corrects him. Uh, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the the, eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. So he's starting to get her to question God. What, what, what did God really say? What is he really doing? And, and she kind of corrects. She goes, so she knows, I can't eat from this tree. I, have to, I can eat from that tree, right? And then verses continue uh, with the next part. It says, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and this is the kicker, this is the big part, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God. You will, you will be godly. When you, when you eat this fruit, when you go this direction, when you face this choice between life and trying to do things your own way, knowledge, good and evil, trying to stay away from evil and do good, when you, when you do it that way, you're going to try to become godly that way, or you can become godly this way. Does that make sense to you guys? In the church in Galatia, Paul's saying, I taught you about Jesus, the tree of life. Yet you've abandoned him to try and do things your own way. You've tried to follow him by obeying all the rules. And if you obey all the rules, then somehow God will love you more. Anybody else ever kind of feel that way? I was talking to a friend of mine not too long ago. And he was talking about the gap. He says, I feel like I'm this good. And I feel like I should be this good, and there's a gap. Anybody ever kind of feel that way? Like you're not even living up to your own standard, let alone God's? And I'm the only one in the whole room. That's cool. That's nice. Okay. And, and he says, he says if, if I could just manage to, to get a little better, to get, to get more good in my life and less evil, that I, that I would pursue things of God and not mess up so much, I could, I could get up there. And when I get up there, then God would really, really actually be proud of me. The gap. Now, that is absolutely 
not true. But when we are walking with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when we are living that second gospel, trying to follow all the rules to become good enough for God to love us, we get caught in this trap. It's burdensome, it's painful, and it hurts a lot. But there's this other gospel, the gospel that says Jesus loves you, died for you, and there's nothing you can do to earn it. At the end of the day, he loves you just as much as when that day started. And the day after that, and the day after that. No matter what rule you tried to follow or not, he loves you and he cares for you and he died for you. There's two gospels. And we have a choice, which one are we going to follow? Now, I think we accidentally fall into one over the other, don't we? We, we? we know that God loves us, but sometimes we feel like, well, if I could just get better, he might actually love me more. I've fallen into that trap. Have you ever, when I was a kid in, in high school or whatever, it's like, God, I really need to do good on this final. So if you help me, I'll read my Bible every day next week. Anybody ever do like a deal with God? And you're like, God, if you could help me do this, I promise I won't miss church for the next month. Okay, three out of four. We'll do three out of four, okay? Like you just, you start to make these things because you feel like the external performance is actually what matters to God. And if I could just level up a little bit, God's love for me would level up with me. And we get caught in the trap of this second gospel that Paul talks about. About modifying who we are and how we do things and trying to earn that love. So today what I want to do is I want to highlight three differences between these two, two gospels, these two trees that we're talking about. And the first one is this. One focuses on what you do. It's all about what you do. Your action. What with the things that you're doing, the things that you're not doing, the things that you should be doing. And the other one focuses on what Jesus has already done. He's already accomplished it. In, in Jesus' day, there was a group of people called the Pharisees. You may have heard them talked about in church or in, as you read your Bible. The Pharisees were a highly religious group of people. They had law after law after law after law that they lived by so that they could please God with their lives. And they thought that if they followed all the laws that they could honestly get their way all the way to God if they lived a perfect enough life. But Jesus speaks to them in John chapter 5. He says this to these Pharisees. He says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. You think that you can find life by doing all the things the right way. By not screwing up, by not messing up, by, by, by obeying every law and following the rules. You think that that's the way to have true and honest life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He's saying in this one gospel, you think you have life because of all the rules you follow and the discipline. And, but all of those rules actually are the things that are pointing to me. Yet you've missed me for all the rules. In the church in Galatia, Paul says, it's amazing how quickly you've abandoned Jesus for the rules about Jesus, right? In our lives, have, how quickly have we, I, I'm, okay, how quickly have I, you can put it into your own context, how quickly have I abandoned Jesus at times because I'm just not good enough or I don't have the things, I don't, I don't do it all right or I don't think the right things at the right time or I don't feel the right things, right? How many times have I done that? See, it's true for all of us. I think all of us have these Two gospels set before us, yet which one are we following? And Jesus tells these guys, you're missing me for all of this stuff, the things, right? The next thing difference is this. One of them focuses on getting God's approval. If I could just measure up a little bit more, right? If I could just work a little harder, if I could get good enough, then I could go to God and God would make me right. The other one, is focuses on receiving God's love. One's about getting, one's about receiving. If I could earn it versus receiving it. See, we can't get good enough to earn God's love. But you become good enough when you receive God's love. See, love is the initiator. Love is the starting place. Love is where it all begins. It's just, and it's in that love that we actually have the ability to do all the things. You can't do all the things so that God will love you. You must receive God's love so that you can do all the things. Does that make sense to you guys? 
So it's like, it's, would you rather receive something or earn something? I don't know about you. If somebody's got like $1,000 and they're saying, would you rather earn it or just receive it? I'm like, I'll receive it right now. Thank you very much, right? Like, just give it to me. I don't want to work for it if it's free, right? Like, just give it to me. And Jesus is saying, I've got this incredible gift of salvation, forgiveness, new life for you. And so many times we just go, yeah, but I, but I don't feel like I deserve it. So I'll work a little harder. And if I, could just, if I could just get a little better, then maybe I would feel like I've earned or I deserve this love of God, this new life. But I'm telling you, there's no thing that you can do that will ever make you worthy enough to just have his love. You've got to receive his love to ever get close to feeling that feeling. It's him that gives it, all right? Let me give you this verse, Romans chapter five, verse eight. I love it. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were separated from him, he made a way for us to come to him. Before you were born, Christ died on the cross, paying for the debt of sin that we have. So does it sound like we can work hard enough to earn it? No, he already did it. It was, it's already been done. The only thing you can do with something that's already been done is to receive it. You can't earn it. You can't work hard enough and then Jesus dies again for you, right? It's, he can't work hard enough and then he forgives you. No, no, you receive forgiveness and that gives you a new life to start, right? So he's already done it. Uh, uh, John, 1 John chapter 4 says this, we love because he first loved us. He is the initiator of love. He's the one that starts the process, you can't say, God's kind of ignoring me, so I think I'm going to be good enough so that one day I can catch his attention and prove my love for him, that maybe one day, someday down the road that he will actually love me back. That's not how it's working. He loved you first. And it's his love that is the catalyst for everything else that works out in our life. Now, are the things that we talk about in church good? Yeah. But are they the end of, of the line, is that the goal, is just to do all the things? No. It's his love that empowers us to do all the things. You don't do all the things to receive his love. We need his love, okay? So the, the one more difference that kind of highlights this. Check it out. The, the, the first thing is one focuses on an external duty, the things. The things. Churches are known for kind of rules, right? Like there's you got to do this, you can't do that, and all the things, right? Like, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And so people go, well, I don't like rules, so I'm not going to do that. And so they reject faith because of the lifestyle. So they're focusing on the external duty. But there's this other side, this other gospel that focuses on something different, which is it focuses on internal desires. See, if you're focusing on the external duty, you're trying to work from the outside in on your faith. Like if I do all the right things, my heart will feel different one day. I'll feel forgiven. I'll feel the presence of God. I'll feel if I just get the outside right. But that's not how it works. You've got to start on the inside and it works its way out of you. You've got to receive the love of God, to have that internal desire of what's going on. And out of that internal desire, you begin to grow and all of the things take care of themselves because of something that's going on inside of you. 1 John chapter 5 says this, this is love for God to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So he's saying these commands that are in the church or God's word, they're not burdensome. But have you ever walked through life and thought, man, God, some of these commands are really burdensome. You ever been there? You don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise it for you, okay? It's it's hard some days, isn't it? I, I, I don't want to do the right thing, but you're calling me to do the right thing. You want me to get in your word. You want me to spend time serving. You want to turn, me to give. You want me to forgive that person. God, that is so burdensome. It's so hard. And the reason why it's so hard is because of this next line. He who has the son has life. If we have the life that he gives us, the commands aren't burdensome. But if we miss out on the life and we just try to do the commands, it's extremely burdensome. 
it's, it's painfully burdensome. And as you walk through life, I'm sure there's been seasons of your life as you try to get closer to God, you're like, God, this is so hard. Where are you? My prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. I don't know where you are. I can't do anything right. I've, it's just terrible all the time. And you try to work and you work and you work and it's miserable. It's because we try to do the things that make us right instead of finding the one who makes us right. And when we have that internal life from him, everything else starts to take care of itself. Now, each and every one of us are on this journey of faith. Each and every one of us have different stages along the way. But what I'm about to do, I want to give you kind of three things that I think will help everybody kind of take their next step in the faith. Whether you're not a Christian at all, or you've been a Christian your entire life, I think if we do these three things, we're going to move forward in our relationship with God, okay? So the first one is this. Number one, first thing, we got to fall in love with Jesus. If we want this, this gospel, this, this true gospel instead of the false gospel, if we want to really uh, have that life that comes from the inside and not the rules on the outside trying to give us life, if we try to become godly in this way, in the, the life-giving way, we've got to fall in love with him. There's, there's not a single thing that we can do earning it that's going to work. We have to. We absolutely have to fall in love with him first. And remember, we can fall in love with him because he first loved us. He's the one that initiated it. He's the one that's already taken the first step towards you. And we just fall back in love with him. And John chapter 14, verse 15, gives us a little bit of a test, kind of a, a way to find out if, if we are loving him or trying to obey our way into loving him or if we're loving him our way into obedience. Check this out. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Now, there's two ways that you can read this. If you love me, you'll prove that you love me by obeying my commands. If that was the kind of the way you read it, you might be trying to work your way into proving your love for God. But there's a second way to read it. If you love me, you're already going to be obeying what I command. Because love is driving your obedience, not obedience driving your love. Now, depending on how we read that is really the, our outlook and our love relationship with God. And I'm telling you, I've, for years, I was a duty Christian. I did it because I had to, not because I wanted to. I did it to prove my love for God. I did it because I, I needed to be more disciplined and, and, and I needed to get rid of the junk in my life. And, and it was burdensome and it was painful. But one day I discovered that God loves me whether I do all of that or not. When I discovered that he loves me regardless of all that, I began to do these things not out of duty, but out of a great desire because of my love relationship with him. Number two, the second thing that I think every one of us could use this morning is don't allow condemnation. Condemnation. Con condemnation's the that kind of that voice that uh that kind of comes in and and reminds you of how terrible you are. Anybody else kind of have that voice? You're you're trying to read your Bible and all of a sudden you're you're, you're reminded of something that happened like 30 years ago. I was seven. Okay, no, maybe 20 years ago. Okay. Or or, or how about like. Man, Pastor Worley blessed me this morning. He was singing, leading worship. Man, it was, it was awesome. I love it when he, it just, it just that song, I don't know, it just, it, it hit me this morning and really moved me. But how many of you have ever been in a worship moment and, and you're like, wow, God, the words are just speaking to me. I feel your presence and, and you're, you're surrendering him in worship. But then there's that little voice. Yeah, but what did you do last week? You don't deserve to raise your hands like that. You don't, you don't deserve God's presence. Like, it's just all the things that you've done. Remember what you said to your spouse or the way you treated your kids or, right? Like the voices, the voices, the voices. And that's the voice of condemnation. But look what it says in the book of Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. So that voice, <laughs> you can tell it to go to, go where it came from. Back to hell, right? Like, Get it out of here. Now, let me say this. God will speak to you, but it's not in a condemning voice, but it's in a correcting voice, a convicting voice. And sometimes it's really hard for us to kind of hear the difference 
between condemnation and conviction or condemnation and correction. So I was praying about this a couple of years ago. I said, God, what, how, how do we know? How do we know your voice versus all the other voices if we're just kind of inexperienced in talking to you? And I feel like God downloaded into my heart kind of, kind of a little test that I do. So if something is condemning, it convinces me that I'm broken and I'll never be able to change. It, it, it tears me down and makes me feel stuck, like it's just always going to be that way. But when it's God correcting or convicting, I feel like there's a motivation for change. That this isn't the end of the road for me, but God has a great future for me. I need to get rid of this thing, but, ev- but that's going to take me closer to him. And I have motivation for change. Condemnation, stuck. You're broken and you're never going to change. Conviction, correction. Man, that's making you better and you're like, yes, I want to do that. I I, I, I want to move forward. There's, there's hope on the horizon. And Paul writes to the Roman church, there is no condemnation. God convicts, he, 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 he corrects, but condemnation, that's not his voice. So you can tell that voice to go back to where it came from. Take that thought captive and submit it to Jesus and say, Jesus, I don't want this thought any longer. Help me heal from this brokenness, this, this world, this, this, this sin, this whatever it is. God, help me grow through this. Because, and there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law that leads to sin and death. When that voice of condemnation starts to chat in your head, when you're worshiping God or you're going to do something godly or, or you're driving down the street or you're trying to raise your family or treat your spouse right, and that condemnation comes into your voice, you can say, no, I've been set free because of him. And you can get rid of that. That's not from God. He'll change the way you think. He'll transform your thinking when you invite him into the middle of it. And the third thing that we can do is we can make the choice every day. Adam and Eve had the choice before them. The Galatian church had a choice. And you and I have a choice. And it's not a choice we make once. Because every day, that old way of thinking kind of rears its ugly head, doesn't it? There's always an opportunity to try and do a little better and earn a little more but there's also an opportunity to receive his love without anything hindering, without anything in between. And there's a daily reminder that I'm the son of God. I'm a child of God. I'm loved by him. He sacrificed for me and that I am worthy because he makes me worthy. I can't earn it. He just loves me. And he loved me before I ever knew about him and sent his son for me. It's a choice that we make every single day. I love how Paul writes it in the book of Romans in chapter 3. He says, for no one can ever be made right with God. That's the goal, right? To to become godly, to be right with God, to have this good, godly sort of life. No one can be made right with God by doing what the law commands. You cannot do enough of the things to be godly. But there's this something inside of us that tells us, yeah, but if I did do all the right things, I could probably, I'd probably be a little bit different than everybody else, I think. So I'm going to keep working harder, right? I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to listen to that brokenness, that broken voice saying, oh, you got to try harder, you got to try harder, you got to try harder to earn it, to live it, to learn it, earn it, to live it. But it, Paul says, you can never do that. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. See, this, this, this brokenness, this law, we don't reject it completely. See, every time that the law says you got to earn it, you got to work harder, it's a reminder to you that Jesus has already done it. Because when that law rears its ugly head and says, you're never going to be good enough, you can just go, you know what, you're right. I can't do it, but he has already made me good enough. You, you need to work harder and earn it. I don't need to earn it. I need to receive it. And then Paul goes on in verse 22, he says this. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. Well, TJ, what about all the things and the commands and the, yeah, that's, those are in there. But the one thing that starts a relationship with God is this, 
placing our faith in Jesus. And then he goes on. And this is for everyone who believes. Who's it for? Everyone. Is it for you? Some of us have a hard time saying yes. Because we do believe that God loves everyone else. You ever get that way? You read God's promises and you're like, God, these promises are awesome for them, but I'm too broken to get that. That I'm sure you love and that everyone who has faith, that's, that's good for them, but, but I'm too broken to receive that. I've done too many wrong things. I'm too far away. But the truth is, when God says everyone, that included you. No matter who we are, it's you. It's for you. That gift of life is for you. When he says, these are my children, he was talking about you. When he says, I want to bring healing to the brokenhearted, he wasn't talking about everyone else. He was talking to you. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he did it for you. And each one of us in this room, we're going to respond a, a little different to the message. Some of us have been Christians a long time. We, just need, we need a reminder, man, I've been, I've been living in this false gospel again. I need to get back. Some of you, you're newer in your faith and you're, you, don't, you don't know the differences and you're trying to discern the differences. And can I tell you, say no to that voice of condemnation. and Stay as a child of God. Stay receiving the love. Don't earn it. Receive it. And some of us in this room, we've never made the decision to follow Jesus. You've never actually said, God, I'm yours. I want to follow you. I'm all in. I receive your love. If you've never done that, today's your day to do that. Not what we've earned or what we've done, but what he's done. The free gift. So here's what I'd like to do. Maybe, if you don't mind closing your eyes, bowing your heads. Uh, kind of no noise, no moving around. I want you to listen to the voice of God for you. And remember, the voice of God inspires change. He doesn't make you stuck, but he gives you hope for a future. And today... It's for you. Today, I believe the voice of God is saying to you, you're mine. You're my child. I did this for you. If you've never made that decision today, I want you to pray a prayer with me. It's a simple prayer that just says, God, I'm all in. I surrender everything I am to you. You can pray quietly right where you are. Jesus, today I pray that you would forgive me. Forgive me my brokenness, my sin, my lack of faith. Today I'm all in on you. Everything I am is yours. Make me new. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Everybody says, amen. Thank you so much for joining us online today. If you prayed that prayer with us, we would like to help you on your spiritual journey. If you don't mind going to theshorechurch.com or emailing us at hello at theshorechurch.com, we can send you some information to start this spiritual journey of faith. And of course, we'd always love to see you in person at The Shore Church, 3375 Fruitville Road.